Cinema is a magic trick. At its very basic form, 24 individual still images are shown in rapid succession to give the illusion of movement. But combined with art direction, music, acting, editing and more, this simple illusion is transformed into something altogether more powerful. More than just fooling your senses, cinema can make you believe the unbelievable, manipulating your emotions into feeling whatever the director wants. Terror, elation, or even just pure wonder. And no director has better command of this illusion than Jean Cocteau, one of cinema's most powerful magicians. Let's take a look at his 1946 film La Belle et la Bête and see if we can't work out how these tricks work and what exactly makes his magic so potent. Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at one film each year starting in 1915 to track the evolution of film over the last century. Let's first talk a bit about magic. A magic trick is a form of storytelling, and though not every magic trick works in exactly the same way, they tend to have a beginning, middle and end. The setup where you lay out the rules of the world as we know them. Ordinary chair, ordinary woman. The build introduces a new and unexpected element. A cloth blocks our view and the audience is primed for something new. And the payoff, something amazing happens, something that bends the laws of the universe, something magical. Of course, this doesn't apply to every magic trick, but this process takes the audience from something ordinary to something extraordinary. Cinema and stories work in the same way, introducing you to characters in a world, throwing in new elements and changes, and taking you on a journey into the unexpected. This trifecta of setup, build, and payoff is more than just the beginning, middle, and end of a story, but weaved throughout in more subtle ways. La Belle et la Bête tells a well-tread tale. The story comes from the original French novel, but the look and feel of the film are based on the work of illustrator Gustave Dore. Setup: Belle belongs to a wealthy family that's fallen on hard times. As the youngest of three sisters, she's woefully mistreated. When Belle's father is travelling through the woods, he gets lost and happens upon a mysterious house. And upon plucking a rose as a gift for his daughter, he's introduced to the Beast a terrible creature that offers him a deal. He can leave, but only if one of his daughters takes his place. The build. As Belle spends her days in the magic castle, she uncovers the humanity within the monster, along with his tragic backstory, and the payoff. As the villagers approach the castle, intent on destroying the evil that they believe lies inside, the spell is broken. The beast is transformed into a man, and the put upon Belle is rewarded for her pure heart and virtue. But this is just the main body of the story. Cocteau weaves smaller tricks throughout the film, in its lighting and art direction, in its makeup, in its music and editing. And the source of this power comes from contrast. Using the setup of realism and the payoff of the fantastic, he gives the audience a magic that they can believe in, blending the normal world with the realm of magic. And these small elements of setup, build, and payoff are peppered throughout the film. Ethereal, balletic arms sticking out of ordinary walls. A pearl necklace that turns into a root at the hands of the unworthy. A mirror that reflects your true nature. To realism, I would oppose the simplified, formalised behaviour of characters out of a milieu. To fairyland as people would usually see it, I would bring a kind of realism to banish the vague and misty nonsense now so completely outworn. But these small tricks are only in service of a larger goal. Cocteau uses this effect of setup and payoff, this contrast between the real and the magical in many of his films. The mirror trick is a great example. Variations of this trick appear in two of Cocteau's films, Blood of a Poet from 1930 and more famously in Orphée from 1950. By comparing both scenes, we can see the importance of grounding the setup in reality in order to produce a more effective payoff. Both scenes follow the same pattern. A setup establishes that the mirror follows the same rules as a normal mirror and the payoff when the mirror is transformed into a portal into another world. But in Blood of a Poet, Enrique Riviero's highly exaggerated and theatrical movements telegraph the unreality of what the audience is about to see. Because the audience is already in a magical world, this teleportation effect seems less magical by contrast. 
whereas the majority of Orpheus takes place in 1950s France. Its realistic backdrop stands in complete contrast to the effect of the mirror and to the unreality of the world that it teleports to. Cocteau also evolved the techniques used to pull this trick off. Blood of a Poet uses a mirror placed on the ground, and then a series of quick cuts between a pool of water to create the illusion. Orpheus is slightly more complex, setting up the mirror, building with a pair of magical gloves, before paying off by removing the mirror entirely, having a different actor place his hands in front of the camera, and shooting Jean Maurice through a hole in the wall. Both tricks are effective, but Orpheus took the illusion to another level. In Beauty and the Beast, he sets up the image of a normal French village, a normal woods, and what is on the surface, a normal French chateau. At first, we're only introduced to small elements of the otherworldly, priming the audience for something bigger. Trees part and doors open of their own accord, and once inside the castle, we're introduced to a more extreme magic. To achieve the effect of candles lighting themselves, Cocteau had the actor and camera move backwards, while a fan extinguished the flames as the camera passed by. When played in reverse, it appeared as if the candles were igniting by themselves. This is a simple trick, but the blending of realistic environments and acting elevates it to something more extraordinary. Local children painted with plasters emerge from walls and fireplaces, hinting at a deeper magic that runs through the chateau. These effects are subtle, but they hint at the permeability between our world and the world of mystery. And when the night is over, Belle's father emerges from the castle, and we the audience are finally confronted with Cocteau's ultimate payoff. The Beast. This is Cocteau's final act of the trick, not in just the reveal, but in the character of the Beast himself. My aim would be to make the Beast so human, so sympathetic, so superior to other men, that his transformation into Prince Charming would come as a terrible blow to beauty. Or as Roger Ebert put it, Cocteau gave us a Beast who is lonely like a man, and misunderstood like an animal. Covered in animal fur, a process that took over five hours, Maurice gave us one of the most human monsters in cinema. After seeing the magic of the chateau, we're shown a dead deer, prey for the beast. A stark introduction for a character both powerful and cruel, both majestic and grotesque. Of course, this introduction is just one part of the trick. The callousness with which he demands Belle's father trades his life for his daughters eventually gives away to a deeper, more lonesome character. A creature plagued by doubt, loneliness, and self-loathing, who with the help of Belle is able to elevate himself above his base instincts and act more like a man. Cocteau's beast is one of contradictions, animalistic and bestial, yet gentlemanly and aristocratic, a killer by instinct, yet capable of compassion. These qualities are mirrored in the character of Avenant, beautiful on the outside, yet possessing the callousness of an animal, tender at first, but driven to kill when it suits his needs. And by the end of the film, both of these characters' true natures are revealed. After being struck by an arrow, shot by a living statue, Avenant takes on the beastly form that his nature betrays and the beast is reborn as a man. And here we have Cocteau's greatest payoff. The tricks played on us throughout the film do more than introduce us to a world of magic. Their purpose is to do more than mesmerize and astound. They pull us along the story, building to this reveal. In the opening credits, Cocteau asks the audience to come with the eyes of a child, believe in the simple magic that we see before us, that the hands of a human beast will smoke when he slays a victim, and this will cause shame when the young maiden takes up residence in his home. And the accumulated effect of these tricks is the revelation that there is more to man than what we see, that the basic facets of what make up a person aren't something that can be observed with the eye alone. There's something deeper. Hope and love can be found in the dismal. And just because a setup is beautiful doesn't mean that the payoff will be. Peeling back the curtain shows you more than how Cocteau pulled off these tricks. It shows you what it means to be human. Thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema. My name's Charlie. I want to say a big shout out to everyone that supports me on Patreon, particularly my latest supporters, Juan Zhou, Alex Conception, Douglas O'Neill, and Jay Subs. 
This channel doesn't release videos nearly as often as I'd like, I'd recently taken on quite an intense workload at my day job and it's hard to balance that with other projects, but I am trying to dedicate more time into making these videos, so please subscribe, share and like this video and check out more of my content by clicking on the screen now. Thank you all so much, I'll see you next time with a film from 1947. Le diable vous éclabousse et vous couvre de crottes.